everyone wants. Even if you have little driver ambition, there's still something you want. Maybe you want to succeed in your career, to be known as the best and climb the ladder. You're motivated by positions and titles and perks. You want more money. No matter how much you have, you want more. For some, it's money to pay off student loans. For the others, the goal is a secure retirement. You may want money to buy your first car, or you may just want to be able to fill your car. The amounts are wildly different based on what you have, but you want more. You want a happy family. You've even got a picture in your mind what that will be, two kids, house of your own, a dog named Rex, super fun family vacations to Disney World. You want to be known. Not necessarily famous, but you want people to recognize and respect you. You might measure that by how many followers you have on social media or how many likes you get when you post a picture. Some of you want to be popular with a lot of friends, be part of the right crowd. You want to be the best, the best wife, the best cook, the best video game player, the best student, the best teacher, the best at something, because you want to win. You want to beat everything, everyone in your golf group. You don't want a participation, Roby. Roby? What's a Roby? <laughs> you know, the reason you don't want a participation, Roby, is because no one knows what a participation Roby is. If they gave out participation Robies, you'd be like, what's a Roby? Why would I want a Roby? I never want a Roby. You don't want a participation ribbon. That's what I meant to say. You want a first place trophy. And if you get somewhere in between that is a Roby. <laughs> first and a half place, you get a Roby. You want your kids to win, whether it's t-ball, soccer, gymnastics, academics. You're obsessed with your kid being the best. You sign them up for traveling teams, private lessons, anything that will make them better than the other kids. You want to sing the solo, get the lead role, or be chosen to speak. Everybody wants something. There's nothing wrong with desire when it's focused on the right things, but you don't always get what you want. That's life. It, it can be challenging when your coworker gets the promotion. You have a lot of financial needs, but your friend gets the surprise check in the mail. You bought 10 lottery tickets, but someone else wins the 1.3 billion. Your dream of a happy family isn't working out like you expected. Your home's chaotic, your marriage dramatic, your kids are little terrors. Even your dog doesn't act right. But your neighbors have it together. Their perfect marriage, perfect kids, wonderful dog, and amazing vacations, everything you ever dreamed of, they're living your dream. When you post a picture, you get five or six likes. But your friend, who's not as good-looking or charming as you, has 30,000 Instagram followers. I was with my friend Jonathan McReynolds this week. Jonathan has over a million Instagram followers. And I just thought, why not me? <laughs> You're one table away from the popular group. Every day at lunch, you watch and you wish you were there. Instead of being the best, your average at everything. No matter how much you want it, your kid's not going to be an all-star. The only way they'll make the traveling team is if you drive the bus. But the other kid has college coaches showing up to watch him in third grade. Someone else gets the solo. Someone else gets the role. Someone else is chosen to speak. It's challenging to watch someone else get what you want to see them get the credit, the recognition, the attention, the applause. They're living your dream, and you're not. When that happens, all too often the result is jealousy. You may not say it out loud, but inside, you're resentful. Even if you try to hold it in, jealousy comes out in destructive ways. The dictionary defines jealousy as feeling resentment against someone 
because of that person's rivalry, success, or advantage. We're learning lessons from the mistakes of Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul became jealous of a shepherd boy named David. He wasn't jealous of David's appearance. The Bible says Saul was tall and handsome. Saul wasn't even envious when David killed Goliath. In fact, Saul was so pleased at David's victory that he invited him to live in the palace as a member of his family. But when David started getting more popular than Saul, the king became jealous. It all came to a head at a, a victory parade. Saul and his men, including David, were returning home from battle. Every town they passed through, women lined the streets to celebrate their champions. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we can imagine. In the first town, Saul thought, did I hear that right? Those women are crazy. I'm the king. But town after town, they sang the same song. Saul is slain his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They've credited David with tens of thousands. He saw but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? Saul thought, they like David more than me. I am so sick of this stupid song. He's getting the honor. And next thing you know, he'll be replacing me as king. And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. It was Saul's first reason for jealousy. David was getting praise. Saul thought that he deserved. David had once been loved by Saul. Now David was seen as a rival. Verse 12 reveals Saul's second reason for jealousy. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Because of Saul's disobedience, God had removed his hand of protection and blessing and favor. And now Saul watched David experience that blessing. His jealousy increased. Verse 13, he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. With God's help, David and his men kept winning battles. Third reason for jealousy, David was successful. Verse 16, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Fourth reason for jealousy, David was loved by the people. He was King Saul, but David was gaining a bigger following. David's Instagram had more followers than Saul's. David wasn't just more popular than Saul among the people. Saul's own family became big fans of David. That was Saul's fifth reason for jealousy. First, it was his son. Jonathan became one in spirit with David. And he loved him as himself. And then to make things even worse, this is like, this was the moment Saul's daughter fell in love with David. And when Saul realized the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him. And he remained his enemy the rest of his days. Even in his own home, Saul couldn't get away from David and his popularity. Verse 30 the Philistine commanders continued to go to battle as often as they did. David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officer, and his name became well known. Reason number six, David was famous. All over the kingdom, people were talking about David and his accomplishments. And as you might imagine, Saul grew sick of David. He didn't want to see him. He didn't want to hear one more time how wonderful he was. Everything Saul wanted and longed for, David had. David was living Saul's dream. Saul was consumed with jealousy that bubbled up into rage. Since he couldn't win the popularity contest, he decided to kill David. He threw a spear. David dodged it. Saul told his son Jonathan to kill David. Jonathan wouldn't do it. 
Saul sent men to David's house to kill him. But Saul's daughter, David's wife, warned him and helped him escape. Three times, Saul sent men to capture David from Samuel's house. It went wrong all three times. The men heard the prophets and were surprised by the Spirit of God. Instead of killing David, they had a prayer meeting. The book of 1 Samuel is filled with stories of Saul and his men unsuccessfully trying to kill David. And the end of Saul's story is sad and tragic. Saul never fixed things with David, and Saul never fixed things with God. Losing in battle, King Saul committed suicide. Consumed by jealousy, Saul lost his kingdom, his influence, his relationship with God, and his life. And it all started with the first moment of jealousy. That's what jealousy did to Saul. You probably won't react the same as Saul trying to hunt down and kill the person who makes you jealous. But jealousy is equally destructive in your life. Jealousy kills peace. Jealousy kills contentment. You're no longer happy with what you have. You want what they have. You should be up front. You should be noticed, not her. Jealousy kills relationships. The trust that's essential to a healthy marriage, friendship, or dating relationship is destroyed. Jealousy kills gratitude. You can't be thankful for what you have or what God has blessed you with because it's not as much as he's given someone else. How can you be thankful to God when you didn't get the solo? Jealousy robs you of opportunities. Jealousy keeps you from the very thing you want because God doesn't bless the jealous. People don't bless the jealous. In fact, when someone is jealous, they didn't get the position. It confirms you made the right decision not picking them. Jealousy diminishes your influence. Jealous people become bitter, angry, and ugly. No one enjoys being around a jealous person, and they sure don't want to follow her. Jealousy is an ugly, destructive attitude that hurts you and it hurts others. So I want to give you some practical steps today to overcome jealousy and get this out of your life. Number one, honestly identify jealousy. Quit making excuses. Call it what it is. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. Do you want what someone else has? Are you angry because you got passed over for the job, the promotion, the opportunity, or the role? Are you secretly frustrated when others are blessed? Or maybe you're openly frustrated when others are blessed. Come clean. The first step to overcoming jealousy is admitting you're jealous. And confess it every time you experience it. Because jealousy is something that comes up over and over again. Anytime it rears its ugly head, you got to strike it down. Last year, I was playing golf with my friend David when he got a call from a mutual friend, a missions leader, asking for advice and help. I listened to David's end of the call, and I couldn't believe I wasn't included. In my jealousy, I made a quick comment that revealed my immaturity and devalued David. And 10 minutes later, I confessed my jealousy. And I apologized because I didn't want that to take root in my spirit. See, we all struggle. Number two, to overcome jealousy, celebrate the blessings, strengths, and accomplishments of others. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Choose to be genuinely excited when good things happen to others. When someone else gets the solo, be the very first to tell her how good it was. When another employee gets employee of the year, congratulate him. When the person who's interviewing for the same promotion as you gets it instead of you, write them a note pledging your support. When someone else gets a surprise check in the mail, celebrate with them. Don't be a sore loser. Thank God for their success and trust that God will provide what you need when you need it. Number three, to kill jealousy, think abundance, not scarcity. Jealousy comes from a scarcity mentality. If, if you get, there's not enough for me. 
The abundance mentality says God has more than enough or God has an endless supply. Some people don't celebrate when someone else gets a financial miracle because they worry there's not enough left over for them. Well, God's supply never runs out. They have a scarcity mentality instead of an abundance mentality. Here's an easy way to explain the difference. I have here a coconut cream pie. I love coconut cream pie. I believe coconut cream pie will be served in heaven. And this is a good coconut cream pie from Community Bakery. Mm. That is really good. Now, come here, Mary Grace. Mary Grace is from the South. She's from Louisiana. Mary Grace loves coconut cream pie, don't you? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's so good. But you'd like some of that, wouldn't you? I would love some. Yeah. Pastor David, do you like coconut cream pie? Yeah. Come here. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, I'm not always good at cutting it. <laughs> Lord, help me. Yeah. Oh, there yeah, it is. You don't mind if I put my finger in it a little there? Look at that. There you go, David. Why don't you enjoy, enjoy that pie? Oh, yeah, you can just start eating it even if you want. Yeah, there's no problem. Mm. Dawson? Come on up here. Go around. Come up on the stage. That'll be all right. You like coconut cream pie, Dawson? Oh, yeah. Look at that's a big old piece of pie. Look at that, Mary Grace. <laughs> there you go. Some pie. Mm, it does look good, doesn't it? It is good, I promise. Mm. Who else likes coconut cream pie? Becca, you like coconut cream pie? I'd love to share some of my pie with you. You're my friend. I love you. Mmm. Yay. I'm going to give that back. <laughs> Enjoy that. Anybody else like coconut cream pie? There's a lot of you. It's so funny, you can't raise your hands in worship, but there's pie, you're like, oh, I surrender all. <laughs> Chadney, ooh, do you mind if it's upside down, Chad? Come on up here. It's still all there. Oh, yeah. Enjoy that. You can just eat that right during the service. Mm -hmm. Mary Grace starts thinking, wait a minute. If he gets given out pie, there's not going to be any for me. I better do all I can as fast as I can to get what I can and keep what I can to make sure I get my share. She is right now plotting which of you she's going to come hit and take your pie. <laughs> what Mary Grace doesn't know is there's more than just one pie. I have an unending supply of pies. My supply of pie is not limited. It doesn't matter how much I give because I've always got one more pie. Mary Grace, I will give you everything left of that pie with a fork. Enjoy the rest of service. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> the scarcity mentality says there's a limited supply. If you get some, I get less. The abundance mentality says there's an unlimited supply. The scarcity mentality says, I've got to keep what I have. If I give, if I share, I won't have enough. The abundance mentality says, I get to give what I have, and then God will give me more. The scarcity mentality says, I can't afford to tithe. The abundance mentality says, I can't afford not to tithe. The scarcity mentality says, if there's blessed, there's not enough for me. The abundance mentality says, thank God we're all going to be blessed. 
The scarcity mentality says, I can't lose what I have. What if I don't get any more? The abundance mentality says, I can't give too much because God has more than enough. The scarcity mentality is jealous when others are blessed. The abundance mentality celebrates when others are blessed. It's your choice. Are you going to live with a scarcity or an abundance mentality? Are you going to give and live like God has a limited or an unlimited supply? Number three, to overcome jealousy, be grateful. Thank God for every good thing in your life. Thank him for what he's given you, what he is giving you, and what he'll give you. And recognize that God gives differently to each. You may not win the lottery, but you have a family who loves you. You might not give the mystery check in the mail, but you're able to pay cash for groceries and gas. You didn't get the promotion, but you have a sense of peace and joy. You didn't get invited to speak at the big conference, but you have a church family who loves you. You didn't get attention and recognition, but your kids are serving Jesus. I could go on and on. Jealousy says, I want what you have. Gratitude says, thank God for what he's given me. Thank God for my blessings. Number four, stop comparing to others. Now, this is an old-fashioned scale, slightly supersized. It doesn't really tell you how much something weighs. Instead, you put something on each side, and it tells you which is valued most. When you compare, you put yourself, your possessions, your accomplishments, your talents, your relationships, uh, your strengths, your weaknesses on one side of the scale, and then you measure them against someone else, and you decide the value or worth. When you compare to others, it's not so much by weight, although some of you do that. Instead, it's by perceived value. On the scale, the comparison, the question is, which one has the most value? So let me kind of show you. Could I have a chocolate or Brussels sprouts? Yeah, no doubt. Wins every time. You'd love to have these. There is no one who wants these. <laughs> Alabama Crimson Tide or the Arkansas Razorbacks? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Except in football. Yeah, right. Let me tell you, Alabama fans, we kill you at cross country every year. You may can beat us up, but you can't catch us. <laughs> brownies with icing? Hmm. Or brownies without icing? Yeah, that one's obvious. You get in the mail, which is better, electric bill or a gift certificate? Yep, absolutely. Here's, a, here's one we argue about a lot in the South. Chevy truck or Ford truck? Yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. Take that, Rick Harrell. This one's a little more difficult. A root canal or a Justin Bieber concert? Yeah, absolutely. Root canal every time. Now, those are fun and true, but comparing yourself to others isn't. It's sad, demoralizing, and defeating. Who's more popular, me or her? Whose marriage is better? Who's, who has the big, bigger home? Who's worth more? Who's better looking? Who has the best job? Who has the most followers? The problem with comparison is whether you win or lose, in the end you lose, because when you compare, it leads to discouragement and depression. Inevitably, in counseling, people say, well, if I could just be like him, or if I could just be like them, everything would be okay. You're serving God in ministry, working hard, loving people, but then you hear Lucas saying, and you think, man, I wish I had talent like him. This little thing I do, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Look at him. I bet he doesn't even practice. If I could just sing like Lucas. 
if I could just have control over the thermostat, like Pastor Parker. <laughs> what I just did there, that's called passive aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying, don't blame me. If it was up to me, I would make it warmer for you. I would make it colder for you. I want to help you. Pastor Parker, he's mean. <laughs> if I could just cook like Charity Workman. If only I could be a perfect husband like Pastor Rod. <laughs> when you compare yourself, the tendency is to compare your weakness to their strength. You compare your blooper reel to their highlight reel and you come up short. Comparing yourself to someone better than you is discouraging and depressing. If you're gifted to work with your hands, you wish you were a great speaker. If you're gifted to communicate, you wish you could build. If you're a great singer, you wish you were a great musician. It goes on and on. You compare yourself to others and you want what you don't have. You decide you don't measure up, probably never will. That even leads some people to give up. If I can never be as good as him, I might as well not try. I'm worthless. On the other side, when you compare your strengths to someone else's weaknesses or someone worse than you, it leads to self-deception and pride. We call someone who does that arrogant or prideful. They think they're better than everyone else because they always make sure the scale tips their way. When you do that, you deceive yourself. Author Irma Bombeck shared one of her comparison prayers. She prayed, Lord, if I can't be thin, please make my friends look fat. <laughs> if you want to kill jealousy, finally, embrace God's plan for your life. God's plan for you is the best plan for you. Embrace God's plan and follow it with all you have. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he's gotten ready for us to do, work we better be doing. There's no higher calling than to fulfill God's plan for your life. Nothing measures up to that. You'll never make it trying to fulfill God's plan for someone else's life. God's plan for my life is different than God's plan for yours. When you try to follow someone else's plan, it produces low self-esteem and insecurity. You can never achieve it. You're off plan. Look what Paul wrote. I do more than think. I ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the Lord, God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear so you can see exactly what it is he's calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for his followers, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him, endless energy, boundless strength. God has an amazing custom design tailor-made plan for you. And there's nothing more glorious in following that plan.